Hello everyone, uh, my name is Abhishek and this is Aditya. Uh, we are part of a larger Azure forensic team um, where we uh, specialize um, in uh, memory forensic and we ship a feature called the fileless attack detection which, uh, which got uh, announced in Ignite. Um, so we detect uh, in memory, our, the, the product fileless attack detection is focused on detecting in memory malwares. So today we are going to present uh, a new uh, shell code uh, detection approach uh, and we'll see what are the unique capabilities of that model. Uh, so let's take a look at the agenda. So we'll introduce what's shell code and the usage. Then Aditya will take you through uh, a reverse engineering of a sample vulnerability uh, of RC uh, vulnerability uh, where we'll use a shell code. Uh, then uh, I'll discuss the state machine based approach and how we are able to detect obfuscated shell code um, and the runtime aspects of it, uh, how exactly it works on the runtime. Uh, after, after that, there's a couple of demo, one, the static analyzer and the state machine, where uh, the, we'll show you how the detection exactly works. Uh, and then a cross-platform demo for both the Linux and the Windows version. So let's start with introducing shell code. So shell code is a small piece of code mostly written in assembly. Uh, it is uh, popularly used as a stage one uh, a payload in exploiting software vulnerabilities. And we'll go through uh, one of uh, one in our uh, demo. Generally, the attackers uh, send malicious data that contains shell code uh, to the vulnerable program. Uh, the exploitation of the vulnerability leads to the shell code execution. Uh, most in-memory uh, post-exploit toolkits as well uh, use uh, a bootstrap loader which exhibits the same shell code behavior. We'll talk about some of the core behaviors of shell code. Some of the core behavior of shell code, like position and being position independent, being able to connect to a C2 downloader, stage two payload. Um, why is it important to detect these shell code? Because some of the uh, exploitation that we are gonna take a look even in our demo, uh, doesn't lead to any signals on the host. So effectively, you don't get any signal out of the host. Uh, so there's some of these uh, detections, some of these things are hard to detect. Uh, so you just need the data from the host with all these signals. Uh, and uh, also it helps you uh, detect new uh, in-memory uh, malware threats, which have not been, uh, like, which have not been signatured, but if you're looking for core shellcode behaviors, you'll be able to detect new malware families. Um, so let's take a, let's visualize the problem further. Uh, so let's, what exactly is uh, a shell code? A shell code is effectively a byte stream code, which when represented, like which when disassembled as a code could uh, look like this. Now, this is the shell code, I'm just trying to uh, put a manual shell code analysis workflow. What would you, how would we manually uh, look at a shell code? So you get an input byte stream, you disassemble, and then you look for patterns. So for example, this is the peb locator pattern uh, so uh, position independent uh, shell code generally exhibits some very core behaviors uh, to work around ASLR which uh, randomizes the DLL load addresses. So it's not possible to predict the system API addresses. Now as a result, you'll have to find the system API addresses uh, before you attempt uh, to you know, either do a load library or connect to a C2 and all of that. So uh, the most popular way of getting to a Win32 API address by, uh, is by doing the peb locator behavior that is uh, shown here. Now, let's look at other, um, other key behaviors that we see. Obviously, we are seeing uh, a hash loop, a ROT13 uh, hash loop, which is pretty popular in most post-exploit uh, toolkits. Uh, and then we also see a custom uh, PE parsing routine. Uh, and I'm able to tell that from the offset plus 3C and plus 88, which are like well-known offset of, for that data structure. So we'll, we'll take a, a deeper look in these data structures and these, uh, when we go to, the, to my section again. I'll hand it over to Aditya, who will uh, take you through the usage of cell code and sample RCE vulnerability. All right, so uh, once we are going to write a shell code, we f ha as an attacker, let's go through a workflow of what is typically involved uh, in exploiting a vulnerability, uh, crafting a shell code, and eventually uh, achieving a successful exploit. For this scenario, we have a sample application in which there is an RCE, uh, which we have introduced for the purposes of this demo, which we'll use throughout uh, in the 
in the top. So this application is a cross-platform, so works both on Linux and Windows. Peer-to-peer, -peer, simple messaging application, right? Just they pass back messages all day long, okay? It also sends some telemetry to its uh, cloud endpoint, right? Some metadata about something. Now, the twist in the story is that the application has a buffer over an RCE vulnerability, which interests the attacker. So just visualizing the scenario without the attacker, uh, let's assume the application is running on a Ubuntu VM and on a Windows VM, both on different cloud platforms. Uh, and uh, the attacker is now sitting on a third cloud platform, which also happens to be the same platform where the peer is going to send its telemetry. So make it more interesting as part of detection aspects go. And the goal of the attacker now is to talk to these applications in such a way that eventually they connect back to the rogue peer, and now they have instruction pointer control on both of, both of these operating systems. So let's take a quick uh, recap of how the stack uh, looks like. So the, the areas of interest typically are, uh, so back in the day when you had local variables, uh, buffer overflows would typically try to go and override the return address. And then the security cookie was introduced to stop that. What, in our case, the attacker is going to do is do a very targeted overwrite of the return address, right? So not disturb the security cookie in any way. And use uh, a, in, uh, basically a lack of validation on the application side on one of their variables uh, to achieve that. So reverse engineer the RCE, plan the messaging app, rogue messaging app, uh, send invalid messages, overwrite, return address. Uh, now, to make it more interesting, let's assume all the attacker has is IP addresses and a well-known port at which this application runs on. It really doesn't know what operating system the application is running on, for example. So uh, the attacker is now forced to send a shell code, which is cross-platform, so which should work both on Windows and Linux. So it should have an aspect of figuring out which OS it's on, and then jumping in the shell code to the right place for that platform. So let's see how we can do that. So uh, when we talk about finding vulnerabilities, there are a couple of ways uh, those are found right? in today. One, uh, like for example, the Heartbleed bug, bug was found by manual code review analysis. Um, there is also uh, people who fuzz applications, cause them to crash, and then, you know, then figure out, hey, this application is vulnerable. Um, and there's also uh, good old reverse engineering, loading up the executable in the debugger and figuring out you know, how we can mess around with the program. So we're going to look at both the, uh, uh, the code and the reverse engineering aspect. Uh, so in this particular function of our vulnerable application, we are basically processing messages from the network. And uh, the goal is really simple. It's basically just keep a track of five messages that come in and not do anything spectacular with them. Um, this is the code. Uh, left is on the Linux, right is Windows. You can see the code is pretty much similar, except for some platform-specific stuff we have to do for memory allocation APIs, right? So there, there is a bad practice in there. Uh, we have allocated a buffer which has all read, write, execute permissions on both the platforms. So that's the first red flag. And then second is basically a counter called message count, which increments each time we get a message. And that acts as an index to message cache, which is an array of pointers um, to which these messages can get stored in. Now the bug here is uh, basically that we keep incrementing this message count uh, even when the messages are invalid. So we actually end up reading a lot more than what we intended. And this allows the attacker to now uh, uh, massage the message counter in such a way to basically write, hopefully, on the return address on the stack. So let's see how they could do that. So let's first pick up Linux. So let's say I have GDB and have loaded up the application in my debugger, and I have a I've broken point into the same function we are looking at. I go and look at the frame, and then, as you can see on the top right, uh, it shows this is the uh, return in instruction pointer location, so anything in 400 CAF. Uh, if, you, if you look below, it says the RIP is stored at, at an address ending in DE78. So this is the memory location where this return address pointer is stored. So I've just dumped the hex bytes on that location, and you can see it's indeed that. So 400 CAF shows up. So this is basically the memory location where the return address is stored, which the attacker is now going to uh, use. So now let's find out uh, what is in control of the attacker. Right? The attacker is influencing the message cache data structure. So let's find the address of the message cache data structure. 
and that is you know, ending at DA30. So simple uh, mathematics to basically subtract these two addresses and accounting for the pointer width, it gives you the number of pointers that needs to get incremented to reach to that address, right? So in this case, the number is 137. Now we do the same steps on Windows, get the call stack here in frame seven. You can see on the left-hand side is the, uh, ad the return address location. We look at that particular frame, frame, again get the address of message cache, and do the same arithmetic here as well. How many pointer sizes do we have to move in order to go and override the return address? In this case, it is 47. Now, we said that the attacker doesn't know what operating system they're targeting, but the application is actually disclosing that invariably through this vulnerability. So if I send messages in such a way where my counter is at 137 and I get the exploit to be successful, I know it's Linux. If it is 47, I know it's Windows. So that's an interesting way for the attacker to then know in order when they want to send more uh, meaty stage two payloads uh, post exploitation. So let's do, how do we the, do the operating system detection in, in assembly? So the observation that we are going to use in this case is uh, if I were to load up that same PE file on Linux or the executable on Windows, uh, I start looking at the, in 64-bit, the segment registers. And uh, one thing you can uh, notice is that the, uh, some of the segment registers on Linux have a base address of zero. They themselves are not zero, but they have conveniently just set a base address of zero. On Windows, uh, they have a non-zero base address. So we use that uh, uh, observation to basically make a quick check and the start of the shell code and then jump on the right uh, code that needs to get executed for that platform. Now, attack attackers typically don't send their shell code in the plane. So they typically encode it and then they send it. There are many ways to go and do this. I'm just going to scratch the surface here. So typical idea is to use some custom encoding algorithm, not exhaust, insertion. And uh, now what happens is there has to be a decoder loop which has to go and uh, decode your shell code, of course, because now the encoded shell code cannot run. Uh, and uh, typically the first act of the decoder loop is to go and find uh, the address of the shell code in, in the payload and then run their decoder loop, uh, basically the reverse order of their, in, uh, of their encoding loop, and then execute the shell code. So here's an example of how you would, uh, let's say jump, if you follow the disassembly uh, from the start, you jump to get address, uh, call decoder main, and then call pop. What that basically does is it puts the address of encoded payload uh, uh, in RDI, and at that point, uh, and they can just run a decoding loop. In this case, it's a ZOR based simple using a key for 18, x18, and then just decode it and run it. So some more detection evasion techniques. There are again a lot of them. I won't go into too many of those. But uh, as uh, Abhishek said, uh, PEB is a pretty important data structure when attackers are trying to access it. So they do obfuscate uh, references to the PEB. So in the first case, uh, for, for going to FS30, they will break it down by having it 2C in and then adding 4 to it in hex. Uh, so that's one way to throw off static analysis. Attack, uh, attackers also change their behavior if they know they are being watched. So like if uh, the PEV has a field which shows if the debugger is present for that application, and they can change their behavior on that. And the third example is that a lot of uh, solutions hook uh, important uh, Windows APIs to know if uh, malware authors are using them or their sample is using them. And what the shell code can do is they can just very well read the first byte of that API and just look it for common uh, assembly instructions denoting hooking and then just not do their behavior. So uh, after all that doom and gloom, let's go to the more positive aspects of detection. A little bit shake. Yeah, thank you, Aditya. Um, so before we go to the demo of the exploitation and the state machine, let's introduce what's our, what's our uh, solution or what's our approach to detecting these attacks. Um, so coming back to the same old slide, yeah, so basically some byte stream, this byte stream comes from um, the process memory as an input and comes to the detection engine. And uh, eventually you look at uh, the disassembly, figure out some pattern. So this is a high level analysis workflow. But okay, so what's our approach? So first, let's define our goal. Our goal is to scan large memory segments spanning many pages. Uh, a page size is 4 KB. 
with the least amount of CPU cycles. Uh, memory segment uh, generally can be really large um, and uh, sp can span from like a few MBs to like, uh, like hundreds of MB at times. Uh, sometimes due to application bug or sometimes due to bad practices used by applications. So it's like if you, if you just go by, like I'll scan all code pages in a process memory, it can, uh, it can become very expensive. So in order to uh, achieve the speed uh, of uh, uh, the speed uh, with least uh, and detection with least amount of CPU cost. Uh, we have a two-stage solution. The stage one is a page selection algorithm that selects a very very small subset of the page of uh, the large, of the memory segment. Um, it's based on uh, a bunch of features uh, like the, uh, FS segment uh, register um, uh, references, uh, indirect calls where calls are being made uh, for um, uh, you know. You, you're calling a register, basically call RBX, RCX, indirect calls. Um, then loops and uh, number of loops. Uh, so basically we use the loop density uh, in a page. Um, so these are some of the uh, input that goes uh, in the selecting of the page uh, with different weights, each carry different weights. Uh, but um, so effectively in stage two, you're only left with a small set of pages. In stage two, the selected candidate pages go through a very uh, uh, deep analysis of uh, where, which, where we use the state machine. Effectively, it achieves the effect of emulation, um, which can uh, detect suspicious call flow loops, um, uh, loops, processes the instructions between the loop uh, parameters and accesses to system data structure. So let's, uh, let's see uh, when I use the term operand analysis, what exactly do we mean? We mean operand offset analysis. So we'll take a look. So let's say there's a malware or uh, even um, uh, anyone trying to figure out the address of a particular uh, DLL or a function exported from a function uh, from uh, from a system DLL, and you're not supposed to any call any system APIs. In that case, you can uh, start with the thread environment block, and there you have the process environment block uh, at plus 60 offset from uh, the process environment block, you can figure out the LDR, where there's a, uh, there are a bunch of uh, uh, loaded uh, uh, module order module list, which is um, like all uh, uh, in different uh, order uh, of events. Uh, they are all at predefined offsets at plus 10, plus 20, plus 30. Uh, similarly, uh, once you uh, take any entry from the module list, you can uh, you know, then access the fields within that so from going from step one to step three, you need to follow certain fields, read the value from certain fields, and then read memory at that field, and again, deref that, and read memory at that field. So there's a step that you follow, and even in, uh, in the disassembly, that, uh, that trend or the pattern is visible. So let's say, okay, so we found the DLL base. So after we found the DLL base, we'll have to uh, go past the DLL. So we go to ELFN new, add that offset, and then go to the export directory table, um, there we can get the number of names, addresses of the names, a number of uh, uh, functions, and use that counter to parse whatever uh, function address we want to. I've just dumped the, the, the raw string representation from the uh, uh, address of names function uh, offset, and you can see uh, some of the NTDLL functions there. So pretty much I'm walking NTDLL from the thread environment block to the export address. And this is, the, uh, this is a very popular way of basically uh, bypassing ASLR once you have the instruction pointer uh, to your uh, shell code. So uh, we will look at other key things like control flow processing. Uh, here we uh, detect calls to high value APIs when a shell code is uh, uh, executed. It has to have some core behaviors. Some of these core behaviors are like obviously resolving the, the system API addresses, getting a, a, a connectivity back to the C2, and in order to connect to the C2, you will either load a WinHttp uh, DLL or WinSock and you know, then call APIs within that. So um, eventually when you call those APIs, uh, that code also should be present in your shell code and that uh, uh, if you're able to detect those uh, API names and uh, an API, not names, but APIs, uh, then that could mean a very rich and contextual signal uh, of detecting the shell code. Uh, so basically uh, then we use uh, we also detect uh, popular hash, uh, hash techniques or even in general uh, hash loops that exist within uh, any uh, piece of byte streams. 
and then we uh, one more thing that we interesting thing that we do is we are able to detect certain API calls ju by just uh, scanning the number and the type and the value of the parameters that are being used uh, based on like different architecture with uh, Linux and Windows have different calling conventions, so we follow those rules and we build, uh, as part of our state machine tracking, we uh, are able to detect that. Similarly, parameter buildup and suspicious calls like call pop sequence to detect the current instruction uh, pointer address. Um, again, more processing on the jumps and loop side, so I'll just gloss over it quickly. Um, so on the right-hand side, you can see um, there's but uh, there's a call to virtual alloc ex, the first one, uh, and you can see there are some known constant usage which is going as the uh, as the third and the fourth parameter, uh, and so that's just another way of you know seeing that e even if no one told you anything and you just see this, and if you're aware of this information, if someone makes you aware of this information, that okay, this this is mem commit and page execute read write constant value, and the type of information going in RCX and RDX, the first and second parameter, you will clearly tell you that, okay, this is a virtual alloc call. Uh, similarly, the second one is a create thread call, uh, and you can see uh, that this, the, the fifth and the sixth parameter is moving 0H, which is like a number, so it's not uh, addresses, and you're not passing, uh, 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 a heavy structure as an argument, right? So it's just a number passed in as a sixth or seventh parameter, and that is also a key thing. You know that, okay, the, the first parameter is a number, it could be a handle, it could be what, means, but it's some form of integer which can contain an eight byte, right? So XOR, ECX, XOR, EDX, EDX, and see, these are all numbers. So if there's a complex data structure being passed, then you'll have some buildup on the stack, and then that address is being passed uh, uh, to a register or to RSP plus 28H, which is the location for uh, the fifth and the sixth parameter, 20 and 28H. Okay, anyways, so I should move quickly from here to here. So, okay, so let's see what's our overall approach of detection. Input by stream, we get the input by stream. Uh, the phase one uh, basically does a single pass, uh, uh, ON lookup, where we make sure we are not scanning zeros and all um, and invalid uh, instruction opcode. So we try to skip those. Uh, some amount of optimization happens even in that ON pass. Uh, but there, the, the primary input that, uh, or the primary signal that we're looking for is uh, FSGS references, uh, number of calls, uh, number of indirect calls, and number of loops, especially if it's an encoder or, or, a, uh, or a hashed payload or encrypted payload. Um, so let's move on to phase two, so once the pages are selected, the pages go to, the, to, to phase two, where the operand expression analysis happens, and uh, in a specific instruction window, you know, once you start finding uh, PEB references and LDR references and module list references, you know, all of that should be available in a small instruction window, like, the, if it is not there in the next 40 instruction, the probability that it will be there beyond that is lower. Uh, generally, uh, the logic has to be condensed in, in one small piece of uh, shell code. So we look at only in an instruction window based on certain uh, indicators from the phase one analysis. Uh, then we do uh, uh, then we do stack uh, instruction processing. The stack instruction processing uses the state machine which we implement. The state machine basically keeps the state for the register, the stack, and the function addresses access. So we create a virtual uh, set of high value addresses where we uh, mirror uh, the the process environment block or an image, uh, stuff like that. Uh, so uh, when we, uh, when each instruction is being passed to the state machine, the states keep changing, and we'll show show that to you in the demo. Uh, to, so the stack instruction processing is basically used uh, uses the the values in the state machine after each instruction is being passed to detect things. Then again, we do uh, call processing, loop processing, and other important uh, exploit indicators where, like, if you're doing a call pop sequence or a jump. Uh, call pop sequence, um, or a memory probing for that matter. Uh, all of these are considered to be a key exploit indicators. So the, the final phase is the, uh, all the signals get aggregated, and then a detection result is published. So we'll see this entire demo. So, okay, before we get into the demo, this is the last slide. Uh, so <coughs> Windows, uh, Windows, the solution is already shipped. It's called fileless attack detection. It's a feature in Azure Security Center. How does it work? It's a, uh, it's a runtime solution where it 
uh, scans all process memory. Effectively, it reads the process uh, memory for candidate segments. Uh, how we select the candidate segments, okay, what are the suspicious segments uh, in our VAT tree scan, that is something that uh, we can probably do another talk about. But uh, this, once the input stream comes from the remote process memory, then the page selection algorithm kicks in, the phase one, and then the analysis and outcome happens, and you can see the call processing, stack processing, uh, decoder hashing loop. It's the same thing, just reiterating. Uh, Linux is something that we are building, and we should we plan to uh, to eventually get into private pre preview sometime uh, early next year, where uh, we do the pretty much the same thing. We do a uh, process VM read, read the uh, uh, read the remote process memory. Uh, so most of the core register state and all of that code is written in C++ and it's all the same on, on both Linux and Windows, almost the same. Um, so we pretty much do this phase one, page selection algorithm, uh, and then uh, analysis and outcome. The only thing different here you see is, means obviously the, there we use uh, FSGS references in Windows. Uh, on the Linux side, we use a fixed syscall table because the syscall numbers are fixed. Uh, so we use that as, uh, as the key um, uh, input signal to select the candidate pages. So basically we are looking for network calls and, and memory allocation calls and uh, you know, creating a, a new context, new process, all of that. So um, then we, uh, then the other difference is obviously uh, the, the calling convention, you can see the, they have, they like pass the first six parameters uh, through registers uh, for syscalls, uh, RDI, RSI, RDX and R10, R8, R9, compared to Windows where we only use four. Uh, this is all 64-bit, 32-bit uh, is again different, right? So, okay, so I'll start with my demo, which is uh, uh, basically showing the state machine. Uh, so uh, here the demo scenario is this shell code that we are gonna demo is from a real customer compromise, uh, where uh, a web server of a customer was compromised and this uh, shell code was detected uh, in the compromised process. Uh, the, we'll uh, allocate this uh, shell code uh, in a execute machine code.exe process, and then we'll run the shell code scanner uh, targeting that process. That pro once it scans that target process, it'll read the memory pages and then perform analysis and display the detection. Results in the order it finds that. So, so much. Okay, I guess we need to go to the first video, which is starting now. Okay, so this is execute machine code.exe. I should have increased the font probably, but. Uh, so this is just uh, showing you the, the, the infected process. The process ID for that is 19832. Uh, this is the input payload. I just printed out the, dumped the input payload. Uh, and the allocated address is this anyways. So we will just run cell code scanner with that payload. So I have deliberately introduced sleep of two seconds on every detection so that we can see through it. Otherwise it runs in like five milliseconds, so it's hard to see anything. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the state machine, which is in red, uh, not really visible, but you can see the register uh, that I, I highlighted. It shows the PEB uh, has been accessed as part of the first instruction because it's effectively FS30. Uh, EDX must have been zero at that point of time. Uh, this is a 32-bit shell code, and you can see that LDR from PEB to LDR, and then we are going further to in memory order module list. And you can see these, these offsets that I'm highlighting, plus 0C, plus 14, are the offset that we were walking uh, in that slide where uh, in the debugger output. So eventually there are two different signals coming. One is coming because of, the, um, of, of monitoring the state machine, and the second one is coming just because of the pattern matching that's happening. So if both the signals uh, are present, as the byte stream passes, it becomes a stronger signal. Um, and state machine is 100% true positive, but there can be false positive in the operand analysis because that's more of a pattern analysis in a particular instruction window. So as we pass by, you can see the register value keeps changing because as these instructions come in, uh, they, the, we have a virtual, uh, processor which basically executes these instructions uh, uh, updating the state machine. So this is the rotate rot 13 hash loops that you can see. 
Uh, as we move forward, you can see, we should start seeing some hashes on the, yeah. So you can see some hashes now on the stack and that's the value of the stack that I've, on the stack I've highlighted the value. So hash of vinnet, different vinnet functions. Uh, yeah, HTTP open request A and uh, more hashes. Uh, so the, the stack scan happens based on the last six. We assume that uh, there, at the max you'll pass six parameters to a, to a function call. So we only scan the uh, six entries on the stack. Uh, this one is special because this is the uh, virtual alloc call and you can see the exact parameters, 0x1000, 0x40 there. So the detection is happening both from the st state machine and also because of the parameter scanning. This is a call pop pop sequence, which is also a good indicator uh, of that. So here's the classification eventually. It's, 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 uh, it's, because, it's malicious because of the information presented below, but we'll, we'll go through it. So execute machine code.exe, the same paired 19832. So as you can see, uh, all the detections have been like put together and like, uh, I've just dumped all the detection towards the end of it. Uh, so you can see a bunch of hashes, bunch, bunch of core behaviors that are uh, visible in shell code. Uh, some uh, uh, suspicious parameters that were used. State machine has already verified this uh, part of it, this uh, peb, uh, lo uh, peb locator part of it. The, you can also see this, uh, the, the name of the C2 here, which is, uh, which is also, which, which you also get as part of the analysis. So, this code was not even running on that process, but we could even, without even telling um, uh, or talking to the customer, we knew this is the C2, I, uh, C2 address. Okay, I think it started yours yeah. automatically. So can we restart the second video or? Yeah, maybe we can. Can we go back? Okay. So maybe not. So this is the Linux machine, which is running in some cloud provider, um, which we are gonna use to load our vulnerable application. And this is the Windows machine running in the other cloud provider, uh, and uh, which is also going to run the other vulnerable application. So this demo is basically setting up the scenario that we talked early in the, in the, in the talk. So this is our C2, which is going to be running in the third cloud provider, conveniently in the same uh, cloud service that the app is sending telemetry to. And its job for now is just to listen for incoming connections on port 4444, okay? So that's basically setting up all the entities. Uh, now let's look at what we are targeting. Uh, so again, we get to go back. Uh, uh, so this is uh, the Linux machine that we saw, and we are going to run the vulnerable application on this machine. Um, nothing very exciting. It's just going to pipe everything to DevNull, and it's just going to run there and wait on the socket, waiting for connections. And you can see the IP address is ending in .10. This will help as the video goes on. And uh, this is the Windows machine where the application is running. Again, IP ending in .92. So uh, we have now set up basically uh, the stage for the attackers to come in. And uh, in this case, what will happen is we have a listener application on port 444, but we'll have two more processes which will basically go and exploit the vulnerability which we looked through in the, as the talk went on. Uh, they are gonna attack both the Linux and the Windows machines. And um, in this case, uh, even if they attack the wrong operating system, at worst, they don't get a connection back. So it doesn't really matter. But if they get the right one, as you can see, uh, they are both trying to exploit a peer, and then you'll see the message counters hit 136 of zero-based indexing, and the connections coming back from the Linux and the Windows machines onto the listener process. Now, at this point, the listener process knows the operating system type of the people connecting uh, to it just because uh, it knows the number of messages that were sent which caused it to finally connect back. Now, let's look at detection. So, um, on Linux, uh, we run... Uh, uh, let's say on the infected machine, if we run our shell code scanner, um, you can see we have de uh, detected the legitimate target application. Uh, this is the uh, Ethernet information from that uh, machine going to our uh, port 444 C2. And you can see we have detected an anonymous read write execute segment with syscall capabilities. And even further, we have gone and found the exact syscall that happened. So they used 42, which is hex 2A sysconnect. And we can see the IP address and both the port pushed in network byte order uh, in assembly, which we are able to extract from the shell code and uh, output as additional info, and thereby really correlating that the network connections happen due to the work by the shell code and not just some uh, you know, benign behavior just going to uh, some other cloud provider. Now, similarly, on Windows, I'm going to run the same application that Abhikishek has uh, with some different uh, outputs. So 
those familiar, we see we are hitting uh, the PEB on 64-bit with loader and in-memory module list, so the PEB walk that Abhishek referenced. And you can see the network connection information again, the same uh, that we got. And we are now going to corroborate that with our state machine analysis, which has confirmed the actual behavior of going and walking the PEB. And uh, in addition, it has also found the hashes for load libraries that were pushed on the stack to obfuscate um, and evade detection. And some basic building blocks that shell codes typically use that Abhishek went through. The interesting aspect again here is that we have actually detected the C2 address and the port that it was connecting to, thereby confirming that this behavior was coming from the shell code uh, which initiated the network connection. So uh, key takeaways, uh, uh, as attacks uh, get advanced and they move uh, to try to evade the file system weight detections, memory forensics becomes a key solution. And uh, I guess the slide is gone, but uh, we have, as Abhishek said, we have uh, shipped uh, the fileless attack detection for Windows. So if you guys want to take advantage, you can enroll for Azure Security Center. And reach out to imcd at microsoft.com if you have uh, any feedback or if you want to know more about the product. Thanks. Fascinating. All right, we have time for questions. Uh, we have mic runners on both sides, so raise your hands. There's one in the back, and we'll, we'll come to you with mic. Hello. Hi. Uh, so first of all, uh, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, small question. You mentioned there were two stages. At the first stage, you select which pages you will uh, do the analysis on. Could you elaborate on that, uh, on that first yes, stage? Yes, sure. Uh, we can elaborate a little bit um, because we cannot el elaborate too much on that. But yes, so basically, we use few signals, uh, and we give it different weights. Um, uh, like, like I said, you know, um, there are a lot of research paper published on, uh, on, on detecting entropy of a shell code based on number of loops and types of calls. Um, we have used something that, uh, you know, we, we use four signals, basically. One is segment address uh, uh, references, FSGS references, uh, which is uh, a prerequisite for the PEB walk. Um, the second thing is, uh, number of indirect calls, like if you call RBX or call RCX, generally the compiler doesn't generate code like that. So that is a good indicator. Um, then uh, if you have uh, hash loops, like you're trying to hash at least known, known hashing techniques, uh, popular hashing techniques, uh, that uh, becomes another indicator. Um, and then uh, if you're trying to do a call pop sequence, that in itself could is a very good signal. Like these are all, this is all public knowledge, but yeah, these are good signals of either uh, encoded payload coming in for exploitation. Then you select some of those pages. Obviously, there's always going to be that balance. Like you will, uh, there will always be some uh, payload which will not make it to the stage two. Um, but yeah, we will always improve the logic of our, as we see that, okay, some pages are not making to the stage two because of our weight assignment. How do you make the final decision when it comes down to malicious versus non-malicious? Like, what kind of things do you use for the final classification? So this is only a very small part of the thing that we do as part of memory forensic. Uh, this is static analysis for uh, reviewing the byte stream and detecting cores, basically analyzing the code itself. But we use other signals like pointer scanner, uh, we, where we assign, where we basically, if you have a a phase one, um, a stage one payload. Uh, if it successfully executes, you'll also have a stage two payload. So we do image creation. If there is an MZ, uh, you'll have one segment with this and then another segment within the same process with, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Mimikatz, for example, or a more meteor payload of Metasploit or PowerShell Empire or any of these. Like this is more in the post-exploit world where you, know, like, you assume you already have access to the machine in one way or the other, right? Uh, but uh, if you have these payloads, it's easier to uh, uh, it's easier to immediately say that okay, this is this and that. Uh, with only shell code, uh, you've already seen uh, some of the core behaviors that we use uh, to tell whether it's malicious or not. Some of the times we detect antivirus as malicious <laughs> because they tend to inject uh, early launch payloads when a process is created. So we do have some FPs 
because of other security solutions doing really weird thing, which is quite similar to uh, the malware itself. They'll even have an executable, writable page where they'll have exactly like a shell code behavior. And when you reach out to that vendor, and then they'll be like, oh, yes, we forgot to market execute read, for example. Or if at a very, very early launch phase, you'll also have a problem where the address becomes predictable, so it can break ASLR. So there, there are obviously FPs, but if you look at the core signals that we see, I think we use uh, that right now to signal. But Obviously, for a larger payload, you'll have a lot more signal outside of shell code itself. Like you'll have images and strings and and pointers. You'll have jump tables, which will. Um, so, yeah. Anything else? All right. Let's give a big round of applause, Abhishek, Aditya. Yeah. Thank you.